The reading for today is taken from uh, Jeremiah 29, 13. And for me, when I think of Jeremiah 29, Jeremiah 29 always comes to my mind. Uh, but this is Jeremiah 29, 13. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And we're very happy today to have Shelley with us. And Shelley's message to us today is called The Secret to Passionate and Authentic Spirituality. And God bless Shelley. Full disclosure, uh, this sermon that I'm going to preach today is not my own. Um, our church is going through a book called The Big Four by Joseph Kidder, and it's all about different secrets to a thriving church. Um, and so this was one of the sermons that really stuck out to me in the past couple of months and really had a personal connection for me. So when I was asked to preach, I thought, you know, it was a good opportunity for me to share it with you. But full disclosure, it's not my own sermon, but I have the permission of the person who preached it to, to share it with you. And let's just bow our heads for a word of prayer before we start. Father in heaven, thank you for this opportunity today to gather in your house, to be with you and to be with your spirit. Please send your spirit to be with us today. Please speak through me and to me. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. So as I mentioned, we're going through the book, The Big Four, and The Four Secrets to a Thriving Church. And the topic for today um, is called pa is Passion for God's Present, and the secret is passionate and authentic spirituality. So if you can think back to your own experience when you first joined the church, I know I can think about my own. When I first was baptized and I was 12 years old, I was super excited. I was so happy to be part of the church. I could take part in communion. I wanted to be part of Sabbath school. I wanted to be part of everything. And then I can think back later on when I was rebaptized with my husband um, later on in life. Um, you know, I can just remember being on fire. All I wanted to do was be part of, you know, whatever was going on, you know, talking to people about Jesus and praying. And typically when you first become a Christian, whenever that is, you care about nothing else about except spreading God's word. I mean, I was willing to do anything. I even, when we started coming back to church, I was even willing to, um, at that point, go to my boss and talk to him about the Sabbath, which I had never been willing to do before. But work required to bring about Jesus' second coming. Um, and as new Christians, we're always ready to implement whatever is necessary to, to bring about this work. Our church programs are often touted as the missing ingredient to bringing about the Great Commission or the second coming. Examples can be like prayer groups and Bible studies and evangelistic series and like small groups, teaching Sabbath school, vacation Bible school, all these kinds of things. They can be touted to as being what's necessary to finish the Great Commission. And then if those are the secret, yeah, we're willing to do them. Sign me up, I'll do this, I'll do that. I, I, I'm really happy to do that. When I was young in the church, I was sure that I was going to see Jesus come back before I ever had children. Like before I was even a teenager. I thought for sure Jesus was coming back. The atmosphere at that time, when I was young, I remember there was Revelation series and there was all kinds of ingathering and just so many programs and everything going on. It was all about getting the work done so that Jesus could come back soon. 
And when I got married, even then I was like, man, I know it hasn't happened yet, but I'm still, I was even kind of like, you know, a little bit detrimental to myself saying, I was a little bit selfish saying, I, I, I wanna have kids before Jesus comes. Like maybe it could just hold off a little bit because I wanna experience that. But I was convinced that I wouldn't be able to do that because we were finishing the work and it was gonna be done. So how are we doing with finishing the work? How are we doing with that? Jesus still hasn't come, and I have a 19-year-old sitting in the front seat right here this morning. So in this book, The Big Four, Joseph Kidder, he's the author, he talks about one of his experiences. And it was a church that he was part of. There was about 80 members, which is, it's an average-sized church. It's a decent-sized church, maybe a little bit bigger than this, maybe roughly around the size of Halifax. And this was a very normal church, but they had a really great vision. One day they got together, all of the members, and they said, what can we do? We want to build a church that can seat 600 people. You know, any, God can do anything, right? Let's build a church for 600 people. You know, if you build it, they will come kind of thing. So they have this vision, right? And over the next several years, because of how active and emphatic they are about their vision and their mission, their congregation grew to about 100 people, which is a pretty big jump. That's good. Then they said, okay, we're growing. Let's start um, preparing for our dream church. So they start designing the new building, and they start fighting. And side note, I'm not talking about a church building project that's going on right now. Just so you know, this isn't a hidden example. Um, so the fighting was happening, and that caused attendance to drop to about 40. And it stayed there for a period of about one year. And this is when Joseph Kidder, the author of the book, arrived as their pastor. He wanted to take on this church as a challenge. He was really excited, actually, because he wanted to become an expert on church growth. And at the time, he was working on his doctoral degree about leadership and uh, church development. So this was a perfect opportunity. I'm going to put into practice everything I learned at school. I'm going to use all my knowledge, strategic plans, programs, put them all into practice. So we could call him a scientific church grower. He was going to use the formulas, the numbers, the strategies, put it all into place. So for three and a half years, he worked 60 to 80 hours per week, putting everything into practice. He was on fire, like all the time, like in it, right? His wife joined him, 30 to 40 hours, so now we're up to like 90, 120 hours per week. They put in all their effort, everything. And then something unusual happened. After three and a half years of intense effort, cutting edge church growth methods, Attendance went from 40 to, what do you think, 30, <laughs> right? He had become a decline expert, not a growth expert. He'd spent three and a half years doing his absolute best, and the church growth declined. Like, what? Why? What happened? In his words, he says, I was unplugged from the source of life. I was separated from the vine, I had forgotten the most important ingredient in healthy church development, and that is, we know, the power of God. God is the one who grows his church. So what's our experience? I can tell you what mine is with 100% accuracy, because I don't know what your individual experiences are, but I know that in many cases, and that in many times over the years, even back to my you know, example of when I first started, I have replaced God's pure power with other things. I like to call them solutions. Ways to improve mine and my church members and my Sabbath school students and whoever's around me, ways to improve their spiritual experience. Whether that be, like I said, putting on this program or that program or cooking classes or all of the things that we can put into place. But have I, or we, replaced God's pure power with programs or AKA solutions? We're gonna look at today's church in terms of behaviors. So there's apparently, there's a top 10, you know there's a top 10 with everything in every category, but there is statistically a top 10 things 
in the churches, Adventist church specifically, that leaders and church members complain about. Number one is apathy. So that's a lack of emotion from members. Shallowness, we know what shallowness is, not being authentic with the people who are around us. Worldliness. Number four, failure to give, that's our tithes and offerings. Pastoral burnout or leadership burnout, and we all know that the same people typically gets in the same leadership positions because they're the ones willing to do that, and they burn out really quick. Number six, teenage dropout. Number seven, fear of evangelism. Number eight, I like this one because it really relates to me, flabby uh, self-discipline. Number nine, max dose schedules with no real results. And number 10 is a chronic shortage of strong and committed individuals. So here we have the top 10 behaviors or characteristics of our church today. And this is what we, this is what we think, or this is what we you know, char characterize as being what's wrong with our church today. But there's nothing new under the sun, right? God always provides us with his solutions. So how do we, how do we change that? How do we um, overcome that issue? Well, like I said, nothing new under the sun. We can look back to the early church. So 2,000 years ago, how were they doing? In terms of numbers. So we saw the numbers of one church, simple, uh, a sample church from today. Um, you know, it could look like, you know, it goes from 80 to 100 to 40 to 30. Not good. But the primitive church, how were they doing? They were doing very well. When we look at Acts 1 and 2, and you can see in those chapters that it went from 120 believers in the upper room praying on the morning of Pentecost day, and by that evening, they were over 3,120. Now, I don't know if in all of the mathematicians out there, but that's exponential, is it not? <laughs> But that growth wasn't just once, it was kept going, it was exponential. So like, okay, how are they doing that? Maybe if we could figure out what they were doing, then we could put that into practice, and we could do the same thing, right? So, we've seen how the primitive church did with numbers, and how we're doing with numbers, versus some of our numbers. And now we're gonna look at what they were doing in terms of behaviors. We looked at our behaviors as well, and we're gonna look at what their behaviors were. So let's read that. They devoted themselves to the apostles, teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, so that's eating together. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs, so lots of miracles happening, the miracles and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and they had everything in common. So everything in common, it's not your things, my things, it's our things. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts, every day. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number, how often? Daily, those who were being saved. So we see our behaviors, we've looked at it, apathy, shallowness, worldliness, all of these things. But in this verse, we see the things or the behaviors of the disciples and their followers. We see unity. We see commitment, generosity, selflessness, humility, love, fellowship or eating together, overcoming their obstacles together like paganism and Phariseeism and persecution and all of those things. Because what they were doing, the behaviors that they were implementing, the gospel was able to reach the whole world in just a few decades. And Paul tells us that the whole gospel did reach the known world at that time. So they did. 
So we see their behaviors and we say, okay, what, how, how are we gonna do these behaviors? Like how are we gonna have unity, generosity, selflessness, all these things? So what are our possible solutions? Maybe potluck every week. I know I love it when I come to Pugwash. You guys always have potluck and it really does create a sense of camaraderie. Um, maybe it's more spirit-filled preaching, more, you know, uh, better preaching, more small groups. I know that one's really touted a lot in Halifax because we're a big congregation and we talk about breaking off into small groups and, and being able to have more, um, you know, fellowship that way. A better building maybe. I know we're looking at that in Halifax too. Better methods. I think if we could stand here for an hour, we could probably come up with half a dozen or a dozen ideas of what we could do. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying these things aren't important and that they are good things. But once we do them, we get there, we achieve them. We realize that we're in the exact same spot spiritually, except we're exhausted. We're like Pastor Kidder. He worked for three and a half years, 120 hours a week, and his church declined. He was exhausted. So why is the primitive church succeeding where we didn't and we aren't succeeding? Let's take a look. So Acts 2 verse 4, and this is important. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, let's say it again. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So wouldn't that be great if we could speak in the gift of tongues today? We have, I know in Halifax and you here too in Pugwash have a lot of multiculturalism. You have a lot of different cultures, a lot of different languages, and it would be great if we had that gift. But what's God's solution? We see it in this text, but let's look at Zechariah as well. Zechariah 4 verse, six, 4, verse 6. So he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So we read it twice. What's the solution? The spirit, right? That's it. We're done. Sermon over, right? <laughs> That's it. We, we already know the solution. You knew that I was going to say that. You know the Spirit is the solution. And we all ask for the Holy Spirit sometimes, or at least we're supposed to. You know, we, um, you know, we're supposed to ask for the Holy Spirit daily to come into our lives, that kind of thing. So when they're asking for the Holy Spirit, they receive the Holy Spirit. And when we ask for the Holy Spirit, or when I ask for the Holy Spirit, Sometimes, why do we only receive a portion? We don't receive the fullness. Why is that? And we can look at Acts 2, and I would encourage you this afternoon or this evening or sometime, prayerfully read Acts 2. And when we read it, we can see several things that come out of that chapter. So number one, they're fully sincere. They're not holding on to anything in their life anymore. Not even one piece of it. That's why they have time to go to the temple every day because they have held on to nothing else but God and his work. They didn't have other things. Like me, us, we're busy. I try to call my mom as often as I can, but oftentimes, probably you know, more often than not, I call her and say, I'm so sorry I haven't called you this week. I'm so busy, right? We're busy. Like, I've known about my sermon for a month. But what time was I up till late last night? Preparing, you know? But why is that? Because I'm busy, we're busy, you're busy. We all have busy schedules, right? We're busy struggling, making mistakes, not planning correctly. There's something obviously wrong there. But the disciples, they said goodbye to all of those things that held them back. They didn't hold on to anything. Number two, they prayed with sincerity. And we're gonna talk about that one in a minute. I'm gonna come back to that one. And number three, all the believers let go of their quarrels. They were in one accord. So they stopped fighting. They just stopped. Stopped fighting with their families, their spouses, their friends, their church members, coworkers, enemies. You name it, they stopped fighting. It's not like they became perfect and then they stopped fighting but they stopped fighting 
And that's what pulled them towards perfection. So let's just clarify, they stopped fighting before they were perfect. And of course, they're not perfect, but before they came towards that perfection of getting the fullness of the Holy Spirit. So when we translate that or look at it as to what's going on and how we can do that, we've seen that we look at our programs, our resources, our talents and things like that. But do we ever stop and say, we just need to stop fighting. Let's just stop fighting. Do we just need to pray? Let's pray first before we put all these things into action. If we're honest, and I know if I'm honest with myself, sometimes the prayer part is the last piece. And it shouldn't be, right? God is reminding us, because I mean, we can't stop fighting fully really without the Holy Spirit, right? God reminds us that none of these things on their own, because they're all good things, but none of these things on their own will have an impact or accomplish anything of internal significance. What really works in terms of converting people and in growing the kingdom or the church and living in God's friendship is the spirit of the Lord. We don't need more formulas, we need more filling. We don't need more plans, we need more power. We don't need more strategies, but we need more spirit. So how do we get that? Well, we know we have to ask for it, right? And how do we ask? We pray, but we need to be praying in a united fashion. And we need to let go of all the things that stop us from asking with sincerity. It talks about how the disciples prayed with sincerity. So I want to quickly say that in Steps to Christ, and I can't really reference any particular piece because it's kind of all throughout the book, but Mrs. White talks about how our whole heart, our whole head, our whole person is sick. We're sick sinners. We're selfish to the very core. Even when we do our absolute best, the Bible says our righteousness is as filthy rags. Our absolute best is polluted. We have some addiction to bad and nastiness. It's in all of us. We are in it. We can't help it. So that means when God wants to change us or has to change us, he has to change everything. The body, the mind, the heart, everything, all of us. And the only way we can do that, or he can do that, pardon me, is if we give him our whole heart. So I'm gonna say it again, if we give him our whole heart. So you can see the problem, right? We say, please send us the Holy Spirit, please help us with this, please help us with that, please, 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 but don't touch that, God. I, I kind of like that part of my life. I, you know what, it's okay, like I, it's important, please don't touch that. I still really like this part of my life, so can you just leave that part alone? I'll give you this and I'll give you this and I'll give you that, but these, this don't touch. We put our conditions on what parts of our heart and life that God can have. God says, no, no. The only way I can do a whole transformation of you is if you give me your whole self. Think about restoring a car. You take your car to the mechanic. You give him all the pieces, save one. He gets everything but one part. When he gives you back the car, is it complete? No, it won't work. For a restoration to be complete, God needs your whole heart. And in Acts 2, which again, I encourage you to read, we see the apostles doing this for real, for the first time. They're giving their whole person, their whole head, their whole heart, everything to God. Nothing held back. So A.W. Tozer, um, who is a Christian theologian and writer, wrote in 1985, and this is, this is big. If the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, and this is in 1985, 95%. I know when my kids bring home 95%, I'm happy because that's almost all of it, right? 
95% of what we do would go on and no one would know the difference. No one would know. If the Holy Spirit had been withdrawn from the primitive church or the early church, 95% of what they did would stop and everyone, everyone would have known what the difference was. Wow. What would that statistic be today? Would it be better or would it be worse, right? So the problem is we think we're connected, but we aren't. And furthermore, we're not connected on God's terms. We only want to be connected on our own terms. And I'm talking about me. Remember what Jesus says? Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. So if a branch is laying on the ground, not connected to the tree, it's dying. It's not bearing fruit. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. You're not the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing, nothing. So what is our role? And please, I'm accepting answers. What's our role? Stay connected, right? And how do we do that in a practical sense? I don't know who said stay connected. <laughs> oh, you did. How do we do that in a practical sense? Right. And we do that by praying and understanding what he, what he wants for us, right? And how often are we supposed to do this? Daily. Or at least, at least daily, right? I mean, some people have, you know, a better you know, experience than others. Some people can be moment by, by moment, like Jesus was. He was in connection with God every single moment. And we can be in a spirit of prayer on a 24-7 basis. We don't have to be on our knees 24-7, but it's a decision, a 24-hour a day, seven days a week decision of total and radical reliance on Him which means we have to be praying all the time or in communion with him all the time. Praying with sincerity. So let's go back and talk about praying with sincerity. So if you don't eat, and I, I'm not going to have to remind you to eat later at potluck, right? Because we're going late and you're going to be hungry. So if I don't remind you to eat, it's not going to be a problem because you're totally going to get hungry. You totally need it. And when that comes, you're going to eat. I don't have to tell you that. But if we truly understood the sickness of our heart or the problem with our heart, if the Holy Spirit was giving us even an inkling of how sick we are without God's presence, without God in our hearts, we would naturally go to prayer in order to be healed, just like we would naturally go to eat when we are starved. If we are starved for God, we would naturally go to prayer if we recognize this. But we constantly give these excuses and say no to his conditions, and this partially blinds us. We, we can't see the full picture. Mrs. White says in Testimonies to the Church, Volume 7, Chapter 37, she says this. The first lesson, so the first lesson we teach kids is the, you typically the more important ones, right? The first lesson to be taught the workers, and that's us. We're all the workers. All the Christians are the workers. The first lesson to be taught the workers in our institutions is the lesson of dependence upon God. Before they, the workers, us, can attain success in any line, in any line, they must each for himself accept the truth contained within the words of Christ. Without me, you can do nothing. But oftentimes, and I dare to say most times, we start by trusting in our own power. And what ends up happening is like the man on the left. I don't know if you can see that very well. He takes two weeks. He has an ax. He's cutting down the tree. It's a big tree. Takes forever. He's cutting down the tree. 
And his neighbor is like, what is he doing? Like, why is he taking so long? So he shows up with the chainsaw and he's like, I get this done, right? Let's do this because he's afraid you're gonna take the, another two weeks to cut down the next tree, right? That's the same way we go about doing things that we are trying to accomplish in the church. And this actually just, when I put this slide together, I didn't even notice this, but God works in mysterious ways. And I just realized it last night when I was going through the slides. Look at the picture of the man with the ax. Can you see something? I totally didn't notice it. What's that? It's a chainsaw. I totally, 100% I accuracy or honesty, I did not notice that when I put that picture up there. The chainsaw is right on the ground for him to use. All he has to do is pick it up. God was like, Shelly, I'm putting it in your picture. He is using his own strength when God's strength is laying there all the time unused and he just has to pick it up. In fact, the GC youth leader once said in a sermon, we are so busy trying to make waves or making the waves that we don't catch the waves. Now, I'm not a surfer, and I don't think many of you are, but we all know that surfers talk about catching the waves, right? Wave comes along, you get on your surfboard, and you try to get in the wave on the, at the right moment so that you can surf the wave. What do we not hear surfers saying? Let's go make some waves, right? You never hear surfers say, let's go make some waves. Why not? They can't make waves. It's not their job to make the waves. So why are we in our church trying to create the wave? What do we not understand? Our human effort, it's like that ax. And the power is the chainsaw just laying there on the ground waiting to be utilized if we would only let him. So again, how do we get the power of God or the chainsaw? We speak to him in sincerity. So Abraham prayed, just one man, and Lot was delivered from the fiery destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Moses prayed, just one man, and the Israelites were able to walk through the Red Sea on dry ground. David prayed, just one man, and the stone from his slingshot was guided to the forehead of Goliath, and the battle was won in one single fight. Elijah prayed, just one man, and fire poured down from heaven and consumed the sacrifice, the water, and the stones. These are people just like us. Elijah prayed just again, or yet again, just one man, and it poured down rain, thunder, and lightning. And earlier, he had prayed for three and a half years of no rain. Daniel prayed, just one man, and the mouths of lions were shut. We can see in Daniel 9, Daniel's prayers actually having a direct correlation to his people going back, to, or being freed from slavery out of Babylon. So one man sincerely praying can change the entire course of history. So let me ask you an honest question, and I'm going to be honest too. How many of you would like to receive more Holy Spirit or the fullness of the Holy Spirit, right? I would, for sure. So the good news about prayer is that it's not just about a call to power, but it is also about a call to intimacy with God. Oh, I didn't put this one up on the screen. Never mind, I can go back. Oswald Chambers, he's a man of God, he put it this way, the lasting value of our public service for God is measured by the depth of intimacy of our private times of fellowship and oneness with him. Our private times. In Mark 3, 14 and 15, Jesus calls 12 disciples to be with him, right? He wanted to be with them, commune with them. He wanted to set them up to preach and teach and have authority to cast out demons. I wanna be with Jesus. 
I know you want to be with Jesus, but we all have these things blocking us from accepting the conditions upon which he wants to give us all of his Holy Spirit. And these, things, these conditions can be anything. It's different for you than it is for me. The things that block me from the Holy Spirit are probably very different from what block you. It can be anything, but those things, hallelujah, only have power over you and I because we're not connected with God, not really connected with God. So there is a way to not allow those things to have power over us. So there's a theory, and there was an experiment about addictions. And it's, the theory is this, that all addictions have power because of a lack of connection or communion. So there was an experiment. They put a rat, a single rat, in a cage or a maze, and on one end they had pure water, and on the other hand, they had water with cocaine in it, right? And they put this rat in the cage, and the rat tasted the water and started to always go back to the cocaine water, right? And you're like, of course, cocaine's addictive. Why wouldn't he do that or the rat do that? But then they did the same experiment with multiple rats. Same experiment, cocaine water, pure water, multiple rats. And always in the experiment with multiple rats, not one of the rats tasted the cocaine water or ever went back. They always went to the pure water. This tells me what many experts of addi addiction have said that our hearts are made for communion. Rats' hearts are made for communion. They do better in life when they are together and have communion and connection with each other. So you're like, okay, well, what does that have to do with prayer, Shelley? Like, what are you talking about? But prayer is the ultimate togetherness with God, right? That's our ultimate connection. But the way we pray, and I should say the way that I pray, that's not it. That's not what I'm talking about. So recently, because of this sermon, <laughs> I took stock of how I pray. Pray in the morning. You know, thank you, God, for a good night's sleep, and thank you for health and strength. And thank you for my kids. Please watch us over as we go through the day. Yada, yada, yada. I don't know, you may have a similar prayer. At night, I have the same prayer. Thank you, you brought me through the day. Now help me to have a good night's sleep and be with my kids and please, please you know, stop all the bad things that are happening and be with all the sick people and all those, and all those are good things. But I stood back and looked at it and I'm like, wow, that's a laundry list. It's a wish list, if you will. I'm presenting a wish list to the creator of the world and he does want us to do that. He wants us to bring those things to him. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that. But if I say that every day in the same way, in the same fashion, I'm becoming like a robot. I'm not talking to him like I'm talking to you. I'm not talking to him like he really actually exists. If I called you, any one of you, and I said a laundry list of things, you know we all have that one friend that when they call us you know that they're gonna overtake the conversation and you basically don't get a or word in edgewise, but we love our friends, so we pick up the phone. But sometimes when that call comes through on the call display, you're like, oh, like you don't want to pick up the phone. And that's because it's not really a conversation. You don't really feel part of it, right? You're, you're on just the listening end. You're on the one end. And if I did that to you, eventually you would stop picking up the phone because you're like, this is not really communion. But you're going to say, that's okay. Nah, it's not like that with God. God understands, he knows. He doesn't care about the fact that I'm making it like a laundry list. I can tell him anything because he knows already. I don't have to bore him with the details. I don't have to tell him every little single thing because he already knows. So I just gotta tell him you know, the major things or I just gotta tell him these individual bits. But when we do that, we are in fact acting and saying God, you really don't exist. When we pray like that, we're saying, I really don't feel like God is real. Because think about it. We have to believe 
he doesn't exist in order for us to talk to him like that. Because if we thought he was actually listening, would we talk like that? You've heard it said, like, if Jesus was walking beside you every day, would you say the same things that you say? Would you think the same thoughts that you think? So what prevents people from receiving the Holy Spirit? What's prevented people from entering the heavenly Canaan? Unbelief, right? Our very natures, because of Adam and Eve, is that we believe lies. And we actually, and you may disagree with me in the moment, but once you sit back and think about it, we all, to some extent, believe Satan's lie that God doesn't exist. That very first lie. I assure you that all of us sitting here, me included, you're gonna say, nah, that's not true. I believe in God. I pray every day. I know that he exists. I can tell, if I asked any one of you, does God exist, you say, absolutely, right? But the way we talk to him, the way we talk to others, the way we think, I know the way that I think sometimes, and it ain't pretty, and I'm glad that you guys aren't listening because sometimes I'm angry and I say things in my head that I shouldn't, I never say them out loud, but God doesn't need us to say it out loud, right? I mean, we know that he knows everything we think, but if he, we realized and truly believed that he was actually listening, listening to our motives, our thoughts, our dream, everything, he's seeing it in real time, angels are writing it down, we would totally change. We would totally change. I mean, we, yes, we know logically that God knows everything, but if we truly believed it, truly, truly believed it in its full entirety, we would change. So there is some belief, unbelief, pardon me, in all of us. And once we realize it, once I realize it, that's when we can begin to change the way that we pray. We can start talking to God as if we are talking to a friend. And actually, the person who presented this sermon, I have to put in a little thing here, and I don't like to talk about other people, but the person who, who presented this sermon, and I think that's why it really hit home with me, they were in my home one time, and they were praying, and I was like, in my head, I was like, wow, I thought this, without this sermon, because this was before this sermon, I thought, wow, that person prays very differently from the way that I pray. She literally, sorry, I shouldn't have said she, that person <laughs> said things to God that I was like, in almost a part of me, I was like, wow, that's, that's casual. Like, it's a little bit casual. But it was very sincere. And that has always stuck with me. I have always thought of that. And then she presented this sermon and I'm like, wow. Again, I shouldn't say she. So we know the theory that prayer should be talking to God as if to a friend. But often, unfortunately, it is very far from that. The message of today is that one of the secrets that we're talking about in the book is of being a thriving Christian and having a thriving church is passionate and authentic spirituality, but this can only come through the Spirit, and the Spirit can only come through sincere communion, togetherness that's full of faith and full of belief in God. So I want to do that from now on. I'm challenging myself and challenging you to listen to your prayers. Assess yourself when you pray. Would you talk to your best friend that way? Would you actually talk to your best friend that way? So right now, all of you just think in your mind what your address is. I know mine, 225 Eaglewood Drive, right? Think what your address is in your mind. Um, and your phone number, right? And know that God knows this information. If I, if I went to him and I said, where can I find, you know, where can I find whoever, he would say, okay, go to this address and this is the phone number and he knows your name, right? He knows everything about you. Now, think about how many hairs do you have on your head? You don't know that, do you? God knows that. Do you know how many breaths that you've taken from the beginning of time to now? 
God knows that. He knows everything. He knows your genetics. He knows your history. He knows your motives. <laughs> he knows all your bad habits, even the ones that nobody else knows about. He knows everything. And he loves you. And you. And you. And me. And he loves you in particular. It's so important that we understand this. It's not like in the sense of, oh yeah, God, God loves everybody. He loves everybody. He loves sinners. He loves enemies. He loves, you know, he loves everybody. But no, God intimately knows you, Brady. He knows you individually. And he loves you. He understands everything you did. I mean, how often do we talk about, and I know, I've said this a million times before, oh, I wish that person could just, you know, get inside my head and understand where I'm coming from. And then they would know why I'm doing what I'm doing. We often look for a spouse or a partner in life that knows us or gets us, right? That's why we can spend a lot of time with them because they get us, they understand us. Other people might not get us, but they do. God gets you. He understands everything you've done, everything you did, and he says, it's okay. I love you, and I have a plan. And he wants you and me to come to him in private and talk to him about everything. Everything. Leave nothing out. Leave nothing out. He's calling us to speak to him as a person who fully knows you, fully understands you, fully loves you. And regardless of anything, he loves you. Fully knows you, fully understands every single motive and still says, I love you, you individually, not you as a whole, but I love you. And that is the secret of a thriving spiritual life. God is calling you to speak with him as a person who fully knows you, fully loves, understands you, gets you, and still, regardless, he fully loves you. Amen. Thank you for listening. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, help my unbelief. Help our unbelief. Help us to know and understand that you are there. You know us. And despite everything, you love us. Send your Holy Spirit to commune with us. Help us to have open hearts to give you fully of our heart, not hold anything back so that we can be in true communion with you on a daily basis. We love you and we thank you for Jesus and we thank you for the Sabbath day that you've given us especially to be in close communion, even closer than on our daily basis, closer with you. I ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.